Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of To Whom It May Concern. My name is Malak, and I'm here with my co-host, Maryam Khawail and Inara. Hey, hello. hello. So we have had a very, very long week. No. Um, I honestly think this week was a little more work than I usually put into a regular week. <laughs> I feel too much like a break. There was so much going on this week. But one of the nice things we did this week was attend the AMP conference, which w- is American Muslims for Palestine. So what do you guys think of the conference this year? It was pretty good. I always leave AMP feeling the need to like be politically active and do more. So I think it it gives a good reminder. I thought it was good overall. It had a lot of good reminders of things that about, like you know, I said, getting involved. As well as it had some like great speakers that gave me like different ways of looking at things. Um, like for example, Mark Lamont Hill, a question was asked because he was giving a session about, I guess, just like anti-blackness, not just within like the auto community, but in general. And then one of the questions that the moderator asked was, oh, now that Obama was president, that means we conquered racism in the U.S. And something he said is that I really liked is that you can change the bus driver, but that doesn't mean you're changing the direction of the bus. So it just shows how like there's so much work that needs to be done, not in just continuing the current system and trying to put people in like one or two positions, but actually like an entire system that needs to be changed and hopefully improved for the better. Yeah, branching off that, something that really stuck with me is he said about coalitions and seeing that our struggles, the Palestinian struggle and all struggles of oppression are pretty much the same picture with minor details changed. So he said solidarity isn't transactional. So when you do something or when you stand up for a cause, you shouldn't be standing up for it because you think, well, if I help them, then they're going to help us back. You should stand up for it because it's the right thing to do. And in essence, it's if everybody stands up for the right and justified thing, then we would just have a better community. Yeah, so for me, I really thought that the CAP program, which is a campus activism track, was really well thought out this year. I think they put a lot of emphasis on... Well, I think AMP as a whole, in the past, it used to be more like, what is the problem in Falstein? You know, they used to just educate on, this is the realities of it. This is, people are suffering, people are suffering. Like, it was the same rhetoric every year. People are suffering, what are we going to do? People are suffering, what are we going to do? But I feel like as the years go on, specific to this last convention also, they're no longer, like, everybody knows the Palestinian people are suffering. But it's more like, what can you realistically do to make a difference? You know, they're not Mm -hmm. so much concerned, uh, although donating is obviously helpful at any time, but I feel like they're no longer concerned with just your money, but they want the manpower. Like, they want people to go out of their way. They want you to talk to your local representatives and Mm -hmm. your Congress people. They want you to, like, be active, and they're taking the steps also to help you. How they have the Advocacy Day in Washington, or the conferences like these, they're giving you the tools to make a difference, not just donate your money. Money's great, but you can only do so much if you don't have the money. Well, you need both. Yeah, exactly. And for them, I think they've suddenly turned the lens where they're no longer concerned with just your money, Mm -hmm. but now they're kind of looking for the manpower as well, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. And like actions taken. Yeah, which I thought was pretty cool because I felt like a lot of the speakers in the CAT program, they provided a a lot of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. You know, like Dr. Manal Fakhouri and her peace tips and Dr. Mark Lamont Hill and... Liter- and then Deanna Uthman and her literacy. Like, they focus on a lot of different aspects that you don't really think make a difference, honestly. Yeah, or like Dr. Hatem Mizian, when he- each, like, different student organization was giving, like, mm-hmm. issues that they were facing on campus, and he was saying, oh, like, maybe do it this way, or always keep in mind that, like, the administration is going to be usually against, like, things like that, he, just a reminder. Another panel that I liked, which was kind of unconventional, was the, I don't know if you guys sat through the panel with Noor Ali and Huda Katabi, and they were kind of, their panel was about academic excellence Mm -hmm. and being a social activist, but it's funny because they chose the two panelists to be panelists that aren't doctors, that aren't dentists. Like, they were really, like, unconventional, I guess, professions in the Arab community. And then kind of how they went about getting their education was very unconventional, too. I think Huda Katabi took four years gap year leave, and now she's going back to law school now. Mm-hmm. Noor Ali took gap... Like, it was really... For me, it was really... Things that our community isn't used to. Exactly. And I thought it was funny how they chose those two panelists to give that talk to kind of help you realize that there's so many things and so many positions that we need in the Arab community that are not filled that will make such a big difference you just have to be willing to risk and venture out this is coming from the pre-dental student but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
another lecture that we went to that actually stems today's topic was called The Literacy of Peace. And it was given by Dr. Manad Fakhoudi. And one thing that she said in her speech was that she believes that Maslow's hierarchy of needs should be switched. And now if you're not familiar with his hierarchy of needs, it's pretty much in a pyramid where each need needs to be met in order to move on to the next one. In his basic structure, his first need is physiological needs. So are your physiological needs met? Do you have water, food, shelter? And then after that, it's are your safety needs met? Do you feel secure in your employment, in your health, in your property? His next stage is love and belonging. Do you have friends, intimacy, family, a sense of community? Then it goes to esteem. Do you have self-respect? Do you have status? Do you have recognition? And then finally, it comes self-actualization. And what self-actualization is, is the desire to become the best of what you can be, to find your purpose in life and to keep growing. So she was arguing that this needs to be flipped, that the first thing that you need is self-actualization, even before your physiological needs. Do you guys agree with that? So when she first said it, I was like, no, I completely don't agree with it. I think that you, in order to have a greater purpose in life, you need to go kind of into survival mode, make sure that you have what you need to just have basic living. For me, it made sense because I'm like, in order for me to be motivated to want to live life would be to find that purpose and meaning. Like, why am I living? Why, like, what is the purpose? Why am I here? And I feel like that would encourage and motivate me to meet my physiological needs. I don't agree with what she's saying. Just because I feel like your physiological needs are your basic needs for survival. Like, if you don't meet your basic needs for survival, how do you continue to find your purpose? Or how do you continue to figure out where you fit into this world if you're constantly worried about no food, no shelter, no water? Mm -hmm. Like, you're so concerned with your survival, you don't have time to think about, oh, what am I doing on this earth? Or Mm -hmm. what am I supposed, what is my position on this earth? Right, you just hear your stomach growl and you're like, I need food. Yeah. Like, I need to meet Yeah, food. exactly. And that's when people start doing things that are considered wrong, but they justify it because it's like, I need to survive. So I will steal if it's to feed myself or my family. I agree to a certain, certain extent. So I think I wouldn't completely flip his structure on its head. I think I'd put self-actualization and physiological needs on the same line. Because I feel like, You have so many people in society these days that do have their physiological needs met, but they don't have a sense of purpose. And this lack of purpose is causing them to not care if their physiological needs are met. So if you don't feel like living or that your life has any meaning, then why would you care to sustain it? But those same people, unless they go on to committing suicide, they basically do... Like, they will continue to feed themselves or shelter themselves and do the things that they need to do to survive, even though they don't have that sense of purpose. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I don't think that you can have the will or the time to try to pursue your passions and your desires if you can't meet your physiological needs, your basic needs. I feel like those are the most basic needs as a human. Like just Yeah, and just unless you're unless you're like privileged enough to not have to worry about that, that's when purpose becomes the number one priority. But that's because we don't have to worry about exactly. it. Exactly. You're privileged. And we kind of see this in schools where breakfasts are given out to kids in low income areas for free. So when I go to my schools for my internship, they have a cart every child walks in and everybody's given a, a breakfast so that they could focus on their studies. Mm-hmm. So like they meet the that need of food so that they could actually focus on what the teacher is teaching mm-hmm. yeah even lunch in and it's not even necessarily like really low un- income areas it's just areas where they may bus in students or something like i know the high school that my cousins go to it's also free lunch like they don't pay for lunch for us we had to pay at least three or four dollars every day for lunch whereas they're just they're getting that if they go home and there's no food or Mm -hmm. if they go home hungry, they'll never, you know, starve. The next morning, they're prepared two out of the three meals a day. So it's important and it's there for a reason. I just think they're equal, that both of them bounce off of each other. So if you don't have your physiological needs met, then you don't have the privilege, I guess, of sitting there and thinking specifically about your purpose but also if your purpose you feel like you don't your life has no meaning and no purpose then you don't care if your needs are met but i feel like if you do have a purpose 
then you'll always find a way to get your needs met because you have that drive within yourself to mm, you know to keep fighting to live well do you think so according to maslow like his thing is like this need must be met before you go on to the next step so it's like stepwise right so i feel like that's not always the case like sometimes you may maybe have low food but you could still have um friendship and family like you could skip to another mm-hmm. level Maybe you don't have that safety needs met where you're you're not secure in your employment, but there's that love and belonging. And you people still may like respect you. You still may have that esteem and status within society. I don't know. I feel so like it's more it, of a circle. Yeah, I don't think it necessarily I feel like everybody Just may different. be different. Yeah, I don't think you have to meet everything 100% or else you can't attain the next mm. level. But I just think those maybe Maslow's hierarchy is I don't think it was stepwise. Is it yeah. is it stepwise or is it just saying like it's a hierarchy like what what's is most the basic important. and then what's the most like the highest level. So like, his thing is theory is the needs lower down in the hierarchy must be satisfied before individuals can attend the needs to the higher up. It's like mm-hmm. yeah, so sometimes up. you don't have a job or you're not secure in that, but that doesn't mean you don't have like family or fr- like those types of types of connection or like you are aware of yourself or you're very confident in yourself Mm -hmm. but like something may not be working at that moment but that's if something changed like in order for you at one point probably had some sort of stability in order for you Mm -hmm. to move up and then just because there's a shift now and let's say you lost your job that doesn't mean like you still accomplished that to begin with to be able to move on to the next step. Does that make sense? Well, that makes sense. But I think love and belonging could start off with your physiological needs as well. Like I feel like as a child, you as a that. child, you yeah. And I feel like you're born into with like siblings and like cousins somehow, mm-hmm. or even if you're like homeless, you meet other homeless people. So I feel like that love and belonging could start off at an early age before even your physiological needs are met. Yeah, that's true. But so then you guys are saying. Or what Maslow is saying, that you can't have friends unless you have food and safety. Not necessarily. He does clarify that maybe it had previously given that false impression that you must have satisfied that need 100% to move on to the next level. And then he kind of clarifies it's not like an all or nothing approach. That's important to also note. I mean, I understand that we're also in an era kind of where, or in a generation where we like to focus a lot on like, self-care and mental health and kind of finding yourself and you know as you're growing up you hear a lot of well find out what you want to do or why you want to do it but when it comes down to it if you don't have your basic necessities I don't think you're ever put in a predicament where you can think about your future or your purpose and I feel like we see that a lot of in low-income areas like we said earlier students or children or individuals that aren't they're kind of not given the privileges that we are or they're constantly concerned with the next meal or how to pay the next bill they're never put in a position where it's like oh reach for the stars you know they're more focused on day-to-day survival that a lot of people never even get the opportunity to dream big or follow your passion or or even your desires or even if they are given that or they're told follow your dreams in actuality they're not able to yeah and it's a very and that like restricted fantasy that they have and that that stems back to the whole just being privileged in general and i think what dr manad fakhuri when she had mentioned her flipping the script i think that's a very like i think she was catering more to the audience that was in front of her knowing the social classes that or the economic classes that she was speaking to rather than being 100 percent realistic i'm gonna have to disagree with you because look at all the people that have achieved so much even if they begin at a place of disadvantage. And why did they do that? Not because they're just constantly focused on the struggle that there are now. It's because they believe they have a sense of purpose and believe they can achieve more and then do achieve more. I'm not saying you can't dream. I'm just saying more oftentimes than not, those individuals are the exception to the rule. Like how many people from a low-income area, how many actually break that status quo and pursue their dreams? or whatever they dreamt of doing. They're more exception to the rule. The greater population is still stuck in the day-to-day survival mode. And even those people, how much did they have to sacrifice to get to where they are? Or how much extra obstacles did they have because their basic necessities weren't always met? Like, how much harder was their journey because their basic necessities weren't met? Not disagreeing with any of your statements that you're making. What I disagree with is that that physiological needs 
and self-actualization and finding a sense of purpose are on the same line. That you can't really have one without the other, otherwise you're just living a life on autopilot. And then is that really much of a life anyway? No, I still think the physiologic needs is definitely more important. I'm not saying that the purpose isn't important, but it's just not to the same degree. Like We're talking the about way I'm thinking about it is you need one for the other. Like you can survive with your physiological needs but not with purpose, but you cannot survive with just purpose and no physiologic needs met. But I think if you have the huge sense of drive and purpose, that you will always find a way to get your physiological needs met because you have that driving factor. But well, which one has to come first? I think they're equal. So are you saying, what if the purpose is just to survive? Is that purpose? I don't think a person's purpose is ever just strictly survival. Like, what is this purpose that you guys are talking about? Like, purpose of what? Just when, I th- when I think of meaning purpose, I always think about, like, spirituality and, like, religion. Like, why am I here? What's the purpose? Like, what are... But so that's not necessarily everyone's so then, purpose yeah, in life. Can non-religious people be have purpose in life? Or reach self-actualization? <laughs> yeah, I think so. But that's what I personally interpret it. Like, looking at... A higher power and understanding why I'm here. For some people, but that does not mean that's for everyone. Yeah, for some people, purpose is to survive, find a job, get married, have kids, and then provide for their kids. Purpose varies, but for everybody, needs physiological needs. Like it's the same across the board. I still don't agree because even still wanting to have a family and whatever is still a sense of purpose. Like you are living for something, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and regardless of whatever it is, yeah, it's something that you agreed. That was your purpose. Just because people that have different purposes doesn't mean that it's illegitimate. I'm just thinking of having someone that believes their life has no meaning. That they literally are just surviving for the sake of only surviving. Yeah, isn't survival a purpose in itself? No. Yeah, yeah, it is. No. I would agree it is. Because if you're surviving just for survival's sake. It is not like... Not for any other reason whatsoever. And not even... I'm not talking about you're in the process of finding your purpose. No, because that in itself is a journey and it's like a process. But if you come to the conclusion where I have no purpose, I'm just going to survive to survive. Well, survival is a, it's a basic human need. We're like, we're automatically going to self-defense or like make sure that we're going to do stuff to survive. I just think you can't do anything else if you're on the brink of survival. Like you don't have time. If you're under financial struggle or you're not happy with the state of shelter that you're in, or you're constantly finding yourself hitting uh, monetary obstacles, you just don't have the time or the willpower necessarily to try to achieve your passions, or even explore them because you don't know what you're good at if you don't go out and explore. No, how about if you like think about back with the hunter gatherers? Their entire like life was just based off getting food and this and shelter, or like no, no but also family and community and but like that, the sense of belongingness and but that just oh. I feel like that naturally happens whenever you have a community or people together. Whenever you have food and water. <laughs> 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 And I, I'm not going to go off to say all those people had no purpose. No, they did have purpose, though. Just because their purpose in life or what they believe their purpose in life is isn't the same as what your purpose in life is doesn't mean they didn't believe that they didn't have a purpose on this so, earth. So are you saying that people that are going through depression or mental illness, that at that point they're not feeling like they have a greater purpose, then at that point it's like, what's the point? No, I'm saying that that's a bad place to be in. So when you're in that place, when you think, okay, what's the point? Then that's why oftentimes people with depression don't care about showering, don't care about paying their bills, often sleep all day because they don't feel a sense of purpose. So they don't care but they're about not, their physiological needs. But they're not starving themselves or sleeping on the street. A, bu- a lot of times they do. People that have mental illness or depression or ex- high levels of anxiety. Mm-hmm. They have a decreased up, appetite. Right, like yeah, a lack of and appetite. do end up living on the streets and dealing with those types of situations like i don't feel like that's the it's not the norm like those are people that may have actual mental health that need to seek professional help those aren't so your, your mental health is a basic need though that all individuals should reach or at least be in a good state but in, you can't in order to you can't fix mental health if you don't have food and water and a place to live or a place to seek help yeah, like and you those don't are care about necessity. those things if your mental health isn't good. That's why I'm saying they're on an equal But self-actualization level. isn't necessarily mental health. You can be yeah, a perfectly... You can be an individual that has no mental illness 
and not reach self actualization. Like mental illness is like a separate thing. Yeah, that's, that's a true. whole different self actualization is just trying to be the best version of yourself exactly. that you can possibly be. Exactly. But within that is fine as having a sense of purpose. Yeah, I definitely So it does fall into the spectrum. Well, and I would honestly, Madam, I would even go as far as to argue that mental health is a basic need mental health is i would group it with physiological needs it may not be some like water or food but i definitely think you have to i have, don't think like, i don't think maslow uh, meant it that way though like i think he just literally met physical mm-hmm. needs and but then I'm, but, like, self-actualization has more to do with mental no i could see what you're saying like his his needs were just what you need to survive day to day and then self-actualization is when you and yourself have reached a certain level mm-hmm. but i'm just saying if we're talking about the specific example of mental health like he i think he was referencing typical individuals that don't have any mental ailments like i don't think he was Mm -hmm. taking mental illnesses into account when he made this hierarchy i think mental illness or going through at least a certain stage of having signs of i guess being on a spectrum of anxiety or being on a spectrum of anxiety of depression people Every human being goes through that. And I think that it needs to be balanced with your physiological needs. Otherwise, or maybe it's a personality thing. Because my whole thing is like living a life without purpose is just you on autopilot forever. And I'm not talking about the journey to get there. Because the journey to get there is a whole other thing. And it's a process within itself. But getting to the end of that journey and thinking you have no purpose and have no meaning. I can't see myself caring about anything else if I don't think there's any reason for me to be on this earth and that's just the way i see it so i don't agree with mess <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess it just goes back to your perspective on what life is and if you find yourself not being happy i guess ultimately that's what you're looking for what makes you happy so if purpose makes you happy then that's what you're gonna have to have in order to continue to survive versus if a person just sees it as no just living in itself is what is my purpose versus like makes me happy then it doesn't matter about having some sort of higher purpose it's just that's the basic that i want versus everyone in between i still think you can't (laughs) no i honestly (laughs) yeah no i i kind of agree with that look i think maslow's like okay what do we need to get to this we need to have food water and shelter and then after we meet our physiological needs what do you need you need to fa- feel safe and secure in what you're doing then you belong like then you can feel belonging because those are just i feel like those are just obstacles that a th- normal individual faces i think the way you guys are understanding it is because one is more important than the other that means the other is less important well, so that's th- essentially what he's doing by putting it in a pyramid no it's it's not so much looking at it as one is less it's just saying that one is more you know does that make sense (laughs) like i know automatically automatically if one is more that means one is less but it's not emphasizing that this is less important as in it's not important it's not saying purpose is not important it's just saying you could live with having (laughs) food and water is you need to survive like Like you you absolutely need it or else that's it life is over yeah you can never argue that you don't need food water and shelter like if we were if we were automatically we got lost on a deserted island the first thing we're not going to be like, what's our purpose in life? It's going to be like, okay, how are we going to build a shelter? How are we going to get food and water? Like, that's the first thing. We go into survival mode. Well, but if you feel like you have no purpose, then right. why do you care about food and water? And I remember because go find th- it? it's automatic human instinct to want to survive. I'm not unless disagreeing. You're going that's why I'm putting them on the same platform. No, because unless you have like uh, depression or some again, some sort of mental illness where you want to kill yourself or like go that extreme everyone else is going to go into survival mode like your average individual what do you and i'm not saying yeah people do have these like moments of depression or moments of anxiety or just feeling nervous like everyone has some sort of like issues that they're dealing with but i'm just saying that extreme where they literally have to pick between the two yeah what do you think they're gonna pick it's gonna be food and water every time like we're not gonna and then once we establish that sort of safety then it's like okay maybe we could live on this deserted island together as a community and then we can start build building and these pro- yeah then it's like that's the next level of thing i remember listening to an islamic scholar and he was saying that he would add the need to belong and love as one of the first things you know having a social life mm-hmm. comes first then like physiological needs like so he put that as something that is very important to humans. But then I was like thinking, so like if you were to live alone, like no like human beings involved in mm-hmm. your life, would you feel the need to live or like survive? 
Or does that love and belonging and having that community I think I would use outweigh it? I think I would use the same argument as physiological. So then, that, but that community would be the purpose of that person. Because oh, he was quoting um, Ibrahim, السلام, or like what the story of Ibrahim, how mm-hmm. he had left his wife and child in the middle of the desert. And when he went to, and he like left them and he went and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't make dua for Allah to give them like food. He made dua for a community to kind of like form or to get some sort mm-hmm. of like people there. He didn't say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them food and but shelter. It was more like have them. But in the story, when the child was crying. What's the first not, thing that yeah, came up? They weren't like, oh, <laughs> maybe if we find some people to love us. It was more like, well, we she was need looking for somebody, now. but to get her needs met. But yeah. And the first thing that came up was the water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have planted a community in her face. He could have gave her a purpose to survive. But it was, what was what did you need now? It was water. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to go back and forth. <laughs> I understand both are important. I just think one is you living. <laughs> One's a matter of life and death. And the other is how... Like, it's just a higher level. Yeah, I don't so know. So you're going based off of quality of life versus life itself. Exactly. Yeah, okay. exactly. So Malak, in when Sayyidina Ibrahim السلام, had left, he had specifically made da'a. Number one was for her to... Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, like, the first thing that Sayyidina Ibrahim, before even, like, giving food and shelter, was that she had a sense of purpose in life, which was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, he had made da'a for his family to be able to pray, so to establish their prayer, for people to come towards them, so that sense of community. And then, later in that da'a, he had asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for fruits and food for the family. I understand. So, like, I that. Know, but Manak, too, you made a point that God gave her water first before a community. But her purpose was there first. The fact that she believed in God and believed the purpose for why she was in the middle of the desert and not losing hope and still looking for water in okay, absolutely nothing and not I, giving up because her purpose was. I understand what you're saying, God but what God. the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded out of that dua was giving her. The food and the Her water. basic physiological yeah, because needs. because the purpose was there first, which was believing in God. How is that? That's not the purpose. Yeah, her like spirituality she was, her she was, was she her was, to keep living. She was Muslim when she was living a life with Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. She didn't give up her faith, which is not what we're questioning. We're questioning that in a state of survival, when she had nothing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her water first. We're not questioning her faith. She was always faithful to God. But when I'm she was on the brink of survival, wasn't. she was given water first. That's yeah, what but I'm why saying. didn't she give up and instead run seven times back and forth, back and forth? It's because she had that belief in she God. Did. She had that purpose. She did run so back. Like if she I'm w- saying, what so they're saying is if she didn't have that, that purpose, purpose, why didn't she just keel over and dig her own grave in the desert? Because she didn't believe that she would find that help, find that mm-hmm. purpose. You know what I'm saying? No, I think she was concerned with giving her child sustenance. And that's what caused her to keep continuing to run. I'm not saying that she doubted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there. She knew she was there for a purpose. But if she was there for a purpose mm-hmm. and she had faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then why didn't she just say, okay, well, we're just going to sit here and not look for anything because God put us here and he's going to save us. No, she was on the brink of survival. Her child was crying, so she did something about it. I don't think she doubted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there for them. But I think when she needed to survive, she did what she had to to survive. I just... I think they're equal. Yeah, I think <laughs> they're both equal. arguments are pretty valid. As you can see, I've been going back and forth supporting <laughs> both arguments. So <laughs> I think I'm going to have to agree with Mariam, and I think that they're both at the same level. I would think self-actualization and meeting our physiological needs are both there, like level one. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think they're both important. It's just not equal. <laughs> physiological needs have to come first. It's like slightly more important. I don't know, that last argument kind of convinced me a little more <laughs> towards yours, but still, I think it's slightly more important. Ah, uh, just give us another 40 minutes on the podcast. <laughs> no, I don't over. think so. I think no, when she ne- when it came down to it, God gave her her basic survival needs. Yeah, but she had to have a sense of purpose first. Okay, you guys. But if she, if hers was... If she like, was to say Nebrahim, listen, to say Nebrahim, alayhi salam, his most thing that he cared about first was for her to have that sense of purpose. Because he was on that the brink of survival. He knew what he was getting his family into. No, but like... Malak saying maybe that when you're bringing on the survival... You go back to your animalistic well, yeah, when tendencies push comes to of shove. just narrowly focusing on survive this day, survive this moment. After that, whatever then happens, you could happens. Dream happens. And well, maybe passion. because I'm saying that if you don't have that mental ability to believe that you should make it to the next moment or the next day, 
Then you won't. Then you won't. And maybe, honestly, I'm taking self-actualization a little out of context for what Maslow meant. Because I do think he meant in the sense of being your absolute best self and keep growing and keep whatever. Yeah. But I'm bringing it back to just people having a basic sense of purpose purpose in this world. Maybe Sayyidina Ibrahim made the dot because they're like, even if we die, this isn't the akhirah. So they were okay with that versus someone who isn't religious or having that purpose. He was looking at big picture. Doesn't d- doesn't have that belief. So then what are you saying for a religious person versus a non-religious person? Then the ideas would be switched. Well, he also did leave them because it was a command from Allah's Pantada. Yes, yeah, so so that's that, what I'm that saying. There's like a highest, a higher purpose. Right. Like even if they do die because their physiologic needs aren't met, they there's he a better life after. So it's like I mean, different. I mean, those are possibilities. I mean, I think we could talk about this stuff forever, but what's really important is that we're even having this discussion in the first place because I feel like a lot of people think that just because someone said it in the past, it needs to be true. And they stop putting their own sense of thought or thinking into the idea. So just having these types of discussions are super important and knowing that just because someone said it historically doesn't necessarily mean that it's 100% true or that you shouldn't think it through and just take it for what it is. Yeah, you're right. And honestly, it's fun to have these type of discussions because you do get to hear what everyone takes away from something. Like the way I look at something, like the story Inara told us about Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, the way I perceived it is completely different than the way Maryam perceived it, is different than the way Inara perceived it. It's kind of nice to hear people think about what they take. Everyone's different perception of things or the perspective that everyone takes on things. So these kind of subjects that are really open-ended like Maslow's hierarchy for that are really open-ended to interpretation they really get you thinking like well huh what do I take from this or what do I think about this you know so it's like it's kind of fun to talk about honestly I mean it's funny because even gravity is still a theory it's (laughs) it's not proven technically you can't really prove it but it's just funny people stop thinking deeply about things and just take things for face value and even when you ask them like okay where did you even get that perspective they're like I don't know I got it from somewhere like, I think this way because of something. Or it's what I was taught. Yeah. It's what I so read. So they don't or... question it. They don't think about it. They don't... They shut their own growth. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that goes for us, too. Like, not until we mm-hmm. attended the EMP convention and she mentioned in the peace literacy that we're like, hey, we actually never really thought about it. We just accepted Maslow's yeah. hierarchy at, like, as it that. is. Yeah, and this is value. stuff that you learn. Like, I've taken this Maslow's hierarchy probably, like, three times in my life. And I never thought, like, huh, what would happen if... We thought purpose was more important than physiological needs. You know, it's always mm-hmm. just taught like, boom, boom, boom. This is what Memorize it, is. it, know it. Yeah, this is what it is. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Manal Fahuri, for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to this week's episode of To Whom It May Concern. Please continue to subscribe, like, and follow us on social media. We appreciate all the support we've been receiving so far. If you don't already follow us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Modern Skeps. And please continue to tune in every week on Tuesday mornings to listen to us. If you do have any ideas, as you could tell from this conversation, we get ideas from honestly anything and everything. So if you ever feel like there's something you'd like to hear our opinion about or you'd like for us to discuss, please email us at modernskeptics at gmail.com. And after listening to an episode, if you'd love to share your opinion with us, we'd be more than happy to read it and respond to you. You could also... DM us or email us. Sincerely, The Modern Skeptics. P.S. Don't be afraid to think for yourself.